All right, there we go. Okay, welcome. There is a transcript available, uh, sorry, captioning available at the bottom of the screen for y'all. If there are other access needs, you can um, send a chat to the co-hosts and let us know and we'll see what we can do. Um, again, for those who just joined, I'm Katie Dichter. I use she, her pronouns. I am a faculty librarian at Central. Um, COSI, we're here. It stands for Conversations on Social Issues. I'm so glad you're here. Um, other librarians here, there are many. Uh, too many to count. We have Greta Treisman, who is very, very involved in co-designing this series with me. Althea Lazaro is here. Dave Ellenwood, Elisa Jackson-Porter. Um, who am I forgetting? Adriana Martinez. And I can't even see all the participants. Also, our colleagues from North and South. So yes, this is very much a library generated series. Um, we've been doing COSI since Occupy. Occupy was literally on the central campus in 2011. Um, lots of conversations came up at the time. And one of the librarians who worked here, Kelly McHenry was like, let's bring these conversations that people wanna have that we don't all agree about into the library. And what better place to have them, right? So we see it as the library's role in our institution to provide space and resources to explore these kinds of ideas and topics. We grapple with ideas that we may not have encountered before. We stay curious about how we fit them into our lives and our communities. These discussions will not be comfortable to all members in our community. We ask that you sit in some discomfort with us. It means we're learning together. Uh, we took a short break from COSI last year. If you're new to the colleges, you don't even know that, and that's okay. Um, but now in this moment, um, in this geopolitical landscape, in this genocide that's happening in Gaza, we know our community wants to talk about these things, so we're here for it. As you can see from the community agreements on the screen, we're choosing to center Palestinian experiences and ideas for the series because Palestinian voices have been generally marginalized in mainstream media and systems of power. Um, I told you about the chat already. Uh, Q&A starts, the chat will open back up. We can make a breakout room. If people wanna go into a breakout room to talk individually with one of us, happy to do that. Um, okay, Whew. I'm trying to give Dr. Perlman the most time because that's where the good stuff's coming from. So now, Dr. Wendy Perlman, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Perlman's a professor of political science at Northwestern University, my alma mater, uh, where she holds the Crown Professor of Middle East Studies and directs the Middle East and North Africa Studies program. She's the author of five books on the topic, which we have or will have in our library. Um, including three on Palestine and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And of course, she teaches courses on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What you're going to hear is like a course or two jammed into a half hour. So I'm not going to talk anymore. Dr. Perlman, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? I need somebody to say yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. So thank you so much for having me. I've got about 30 minutes, as Katie just said, to get through as much history as I possibly can. Um, so here are my goals for this um, very condensed historical lesson. I hope that you leave understanding how um, during the first decades of the 20th century, so before World War II, a conflict emerged between Jewish claims to the land of Palestine and Palestinian Arab claims to the same land. And thus these contours of the conflict grew before, uh, before the Holocaust and before World War II. But in 1948, there was a war that established the state of Israel as an independent state and led to the dispersion of Palestinian Arab populations so that the majority of that population became refugees and became stateless and remain stateless until today. Until today, there is no thing as a Palestinian state. And that was largely as a result of this war. In 1967, there was a second Arab-Israeli war in which Israel conquered the remaining parts of historical Palestine, in addition to those that became part of Israel when it was established in 1948. 
that there was a major peace process in which representatives of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the State of Israel tried to negotiate with the vision of some sort of a two-state solution to create a Palestinian state side by side Israel. That peace process failed leading to these basic contours of a sort of stalemated conflict between the state of Israel, the stateless Palestinian people that were all established well before October 7th. So I won't get to October 7th and all that has happened since then, but I hope this gives you some sense of historical context that can empower you with basic knowledge to help you follow the news, understand the news and engage with current. So I'll start where I typically start when I teach on this topic, which is with the rise of the Zionist movement in mid to late 19th century Europe. This was one movement of Jewish nationalism of Jews in Europe calling for uh, a kind of a, a Jewish nationhood and even the creation of some sort of nation state for the Jewish people. This was in a response to uh, decades or centuries of discrimination, of anti-Semitic discrimination or violence, such as the pogroms that happened in Russia, and many Jews coming to the conclusion that they would never have full rights and full safety as long as they remained a minority in the Christian states of Europe. And thus some began to call for some place where Jews would have a majority and where they would govern the land and form their own state. Different members of the Zionist movement had different ideas. Some said that they should be practical and obtain a state wherever they could, maybe Uganda, maybe Argentina, maybe Kenya. Those were all ideas discussed at the time. But there were some who said that the Jews had a cultural, religious attachment to what was then called at the time, typically Palestine, some called the land of Israel, where there had been a Jewish kingdom in biblical times and where that was a place invested with certain religious uh, sentiments and many formed um, a call that this should be the place of this Jewish state. So beginning even in the 19th century were waves of migration of Jews from Europe inspired by this idea who went to this land, began to buy land, began to um, settle and create farms, began to revive Hebrew as a spoken language and started forming what would be kind of the, the beginnings um, of eventually a Jewish state, what becomes the state of Israel. But what was this land at the time? Well, it was called, uh, increasingly people refer to it as Palestine, or Southern Syria, the Southern part of what was thought of as greater Syria, the Arab East, the Levant, a part of the Ottoman Empire, which of course stretched into Europe, into North Africa um, and beyond centered in Istanbul. The population of this territory, Southern Syria or Palestine in late Ottoman, uh, the late Ottoman Empire was overwhelmingly uh, Palestinian Muslim. The largest population was Palestinian Arab Muslim. There was a smaller Palestinian Arab uh, a Christian population and there was a small traditional population of um, Palestinian Jews. This was really a place characterized by a tremendous amount of religious coexistence. People had their own uh, religious identities, but Arabic was the language that was spoke, spoken by all of these people on a, on a daily basis. And you can see this picture in the bottom here is a famous picture of, um, of Palestinian Muslims, Christians, and Jews participating in an event to sponsor uh, the, the Red Crescent or the, the Ottoman branch of the Red Cross. And you can look at this picture and you can't see which of these are Jews, which are Muslims, which are Christians. They all identified largely as, as Ottomans and even as Arabs and as members of this place that was increasingly being called Palestine and was certainly called Palestine um, uh, by European powers and missionaries for, for many decades. Um, the political orientation, as many began to see, especially in World War II, that there was a chance that the Ottoman Empire could collapse as a political entity and be no more as a political entity. Arabs of the area that we currently see as the separate nation states of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel-Palestine. That was what was all really thought of as greater Syria at the time. There was a tremendous support for that to be one single state 
where Arabs would be independent, where they would rule themselves. There was even a, a, a quite democratic movement where this would be a constitutionally, popularly governed new entity. That was what people wanted. They did not want European colonialism, but we'll see that is what happened in the era. Um, there was one crucial uh, um, development in World War I en route to the British colonial control of Palestine, and that is Britain's release of what becomes known as the Balfour Declaration, released by Britain's foreign minister in the course of World War I, in which after a lot of contact with the Zionist movement in Europe, Britain declares, and I quote here, his majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. So here, Britain, the most powerful country uh, and empire at this, at this time, is basically saying that it supports the idea of the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. It pledges that it will help bring it about. And it recognizes that a lot of the communities in Palestine are not Jewish, as we've seen the huge majority of the population. It doesn't want this initiative to um, hurt their civil and religious rights. People could still work, people can still pray, but there's no recognition at all that these non-Jewish communities, this Arab majority might also want political rights. They might also want national rights. They might also want political independence and a nation state of their own. So you can see a kind of European gaze that just doesn't even recognize Palestinian Arabs as, as people. And on the basis of um, that Balfour Declaration, uh, Palestinian Arabs and, and, and Muslims and Christians, especially who would be left out of this Jewish state are aware of Balfour, they're aware of the Zionist project. They protest it from the very beginning. This is a, an example of, a, of a, a demonstration held as early as 1919, 1920, and, and protests of Palestinian Arabs continue across the decades that follow. Palestinian Arabs continually say, this is, we're the majority of the population. To take our homeland where we have existed continuously for generations and make it a state for Jews, especially to make it a state for these Jews who are emigrating newly from Europe is essentially to make us strangers in our own homeland. It's a colonial project. It's a colon settler colonial project that takes our land and makes it a nation state for somebody else. And we Palestinian Arabs won't accept it. That we hear from the very, very beginning. This area becomes on, under uh, British colonial control when the uh, Ottoman Empire collapses in the course of World War I. Britain and France essentially, essentially intervene in these areas of the Arab East, divide them between themselves as colonial powers. Syria and, and Lebanon come under French colonial control. What it becomes this new uh, area of Palestine and Transjordan and Iraq come under British colonial control. And these new colonies are called mandates. Uh, at this point in history, it's already seen to be, you know, politically incorrect to talk about colonies. The idea of a mandate as established by the then League of Nations is that these colonial powers will kind of have a kind of tutelage. They will rule over these backward people until those peoples, these indigenous peoples, are capable of ruling themselves. It was never said where that would come. So essentially, this is a form of colonial control with a, a, slightly, uh, a slightly different face. Um, under British control then, uh, the Zionist movement continues to grow. There continue to be more and more waves of Jewish migration from Europe to Palestine. Um, and that Jewish community um, uh, builds farms, builds industries, builds employment, even has a kind of parliament that you see here, builds institutions, a lot of the makings of a state within the mandate ready for the moment of when it will have uh, a space to become an independent, fully independent and recognized state. There's a kind of proto-state. And continually, um, Palestinian Arabs continue to protest this, uh, this Zionist Jewish state project, and they continue to protest 
British support and enabling of that Jewish state project. And that protest climaxes in a massive rebellion, a three-year revolt of Palestinian Arabs against Britain, asking Britain to uh, reject the Balfour Direct Declaration and support for the Jewish state. And during this revolt, um, there is severe repression by the British against Palestinian Arabs. By the end of the re revolt, they are um, really crushed. Palestinian Arab leadership is all in prison, exiled or dead. The economy is devastated. People are exhausted. In many ways, Palestinian Arabs never recovered fully from this huge effort to try to essentially block the creation of a Jewish state and to call for independence, a single, free, independent Palestine, free from colonial rule. History moves on. Of course, we have the Holocaust and World War II, uh, the late 1930s through the, the early 1940s. The genocide of six million Jews um, convinces many, both Jews who had been skeptical of Zionism um, and many in Europe around the world of the need for a Jewish state. So that's an important other facet of the story. And World War II also has the effect of leaving Britain economically and politically uh, exhausted such that Britain no longer wants to hold on to this colonial control over Palestine just as it had received a mandate over Palestine from the League of Nations, it gives it back to the newly created United Nations. The United Nations sends in a commission and comes up with the proposal to partition Palestine, partition the mandate Palestine into two separate states. A Jewish state, which you see here in blue, and a, a, an Arab state that you see in tan, it being recognized that the areas around Jerusalem were so holy, um, to all religions that they should be a kind of international enclave. So you can look at this map and ask yourself, does this seem like a um, feasible way of dividing two, two states? Imagine if the US and Canada were mixed in with this blue and, and tan, it looks a little bit, a little bit crazy. Um, they were trying to recognize where the population of Jews were and the population of Arabs were to have some viable agricultural land and access to the sea for all parties. But they created this, this, um, this map. Um, the Jewish community largely accepted this partition plan and the Palestinian Arabs said, absolutely not. And one of the reasons they said absolutely not is that you can see in this Jewish state actually is awarded on the majority of the land, 56%, whereas Jews at the time were only 33% of the population. And at least half of that 33%, half of the Jewish population had been in Palestine for less than 15 years or around 15 years. So again, from a Palestinian Arab perspective, this was a colonial project that took their birthright, their home where they had lived for generations and essentially cut it up and gave the majority of it to a very new population um, that wanted to make a state of their own. So Palestinian Arabs rejected the, the partition plan as did Arab states and war began. This is what was be called the 1948 war, what Palestinians called the Nakba or the catastrophe. This again was the partition plan. <clears throat> when armistice agreements were signed, ceasefire agreements signed between Israel and Arab states who entered the war in 1948. When these armistice agreements were signed in 1949, we were left with this map. The state of Israel was created on the, on the blue, which was the land awarded to the Jewish state by the United Nations. In addition, this purple are all territories that the UN had designated as the Arab state, but that Israel conquered in the course of the war. So Israel was able to increase its territory during the course of war, um, leaving the state of Israel um, in 1949 as essentially the blue plus the purple. Those two spaces that remained of historic Palestine, those two areas in, in tan, <clears throat> one is on the Western bank of the Jordan River that is what we currently call today the West Bank. That came under Jordanian control and was actually annexed and part of the state of Jordan until 67. And then this small strip 
in southern Palestine, where there had been the city of Gaza and the municipality of Gaza, comes to be called the Gaza Strip. So the Gaza Strip was created as a part of this war. It's a very small, like six, point, six by 28 mile strip. And some 78% of the population were refugees. They were Palestinians who lost their home in what became Israel, fled in what became Israel, and fled to Gaza. So at the end of the war, the population of Gaza has a small population that had lived in Gaza previously, and 80% of the population were refugees who arrived newly with nothing but their clothes on their back, an extremely impoverished, extremely over um, uh, dense, uh, um, very densely populated area. In the course of this war then, 750,000 Palestinians or over half of the total Palestinian population became, became refugees. Some Palestinian Arabs remained in their towns and villages that became Israel. They were surrendered and were allowed to stay by invading Jewish or Israeli forces. This is the source of the about 20% of the population of Israel that until today is Palestinian Arab. So this is the Palestinian Arab minority of Israel. Some had lived in the West Bank or Gaza Strip previously, or they fled to those areas as refugees. These areas constituted 22% of mandate Palestine. The other 78% became Israel. And these became uh, the Palestinian civilians who lived either under Jordanian control in the West Bank or under Egyptian control in the Gaza Strip. They weren't, uh, they were civilians living under those two territories. And then many Palestinian Arabs fled to other uh, Arab states. And you can see here a map of where different refugee camps were created by the United Nations in the West Bank, in Gaza, or in surrounding Arab states. <clears throat> While the fighting was still ongoing, the United Nations uh, passed Resolution 194 in which it recognized that Palestinian refugees who fled in the course of the war had a right to return to their homes. Or if they didn't wish to return, they had the right to be compensated for their loss of properties and, and lands. Israel refused that right. It said, these people just declared war on us. They refused the creation of a Jewish state for Palestinian refugees to return. They would be a fifth column that would destroy or endanger Israel from within. And this remains a uh, Palestinian Arabs call that re their right of return is enshrined in international law and remains a right that they have the right to, to claim until today. <clears throat> Time goes on, Israel establishes itself as a state, Palestinians begin to recuperate their lives as refugees. And about 20 years later, there is a second war between Israel and the Arab states, Arab states whose governments declare their solidarity with, with Palestine, um, declare their ambition to destroy the state of Israel. And there was a second Arab-Israeli war. This is a war that begins with, a, with an Israeli preemptive attack. Israel thinks that the Arabs are planning war. It strikes first. It destroys uh, Arab air forces while they're still on the ground. And it is a war in which six days Israel has a um, uh, almost mythic sort of, of triumph in which it essentially triples its size. Israel goes from that state in blue to occupying all of the areas in pink. Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, Peninsula Syria's Golan Heights, and the last remaining parts of historic Palestine. And with this, some 1.3 Palestinian civilians in Gaza and in the West Bank come under Israeli military occupation. That means who is ruling over them? The Israeli army. Um, they don't have uh, citizenship rights. They don't have political representation. The Israeli army patrol streets, issues orders and controls those areas. In addition, Israel annexes East Jerusalem, which had been under Jordanian control in the 1948 war. <clears throat> It starts slowly and then begins, especially in the 1970s, that Israel starts building what are called settlements. You have one picture here, there at the bottom. Settlements are um, Israeli, Jewish Israeli residences built in the territories occupied in 67. So either the West Bank, Gaza Strip, or in East Jerusalem. 
their towns. They have uh, often commercial districts um, and soon tens to hundreds of thousands of Israeli Jews start to live in these, these areas. Um, this is illegal in international law, which says that it's illegal to transfer civilian population to territory occupied by war. And many believe this is Israel trying essentially to, um, to claim that land within these occupied territories uh, for Israel itself and land being annexed or, or confiscated um, uh, perhaps from the, its Arab owners or, or, or land that, um, that Israel can claim in different ways. <clears throat> the Palestinian uh, national movement continues to grow. Um, uh, in those eras, those earlier eras, Palestinian refugees had really looked to Arab states to, um, to lead its struggle, but uh, they form their own national uh, representative, which calls, uh, is called the Palestinian Liberation Organization or the PLO. The PLO is an umbrella of lots of different political parties, the largest which is, is FETA. And the PLO uh, pledges a, an ideology of using armed struggle and attacks, and also uses various diplomatic means to try to get recognition of Palestinian rights. Um, meanwhile, over a million Palestinian civilians are living under Israeli occupation. And after 20 years under occupation, there is a mass popular uprising, the first grassroots popular, uh, popular uprising of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, essentially trying to uh, force Israel to withdraw from those territories, to end the occupation, to allow Palestinians to be free and have a state of their own. And that uprising is called the Intifada, which means uprising in, in Arabic. <clears throat> the Intifada uh, was a sort of resurgence of Palestinian pride and identity, and also convinced many Israelis that the occupation was not sustainable, and it was in Israel's own interest to withdraw from those territories. That's the context in which uh, the state of Israel and the PLO begin secretly to negotiate how they could have some sort of a peace process that could end the conflict. This is called the Oslo peace process because the secret talks occurred in Oslo, Norway, and it kicks off in 1993. Oslo was not a peace agreement. It was not a treaty and an agreement to end the conflict. Essentially, it was an agreement to start talking. It was a framework that the parties could come together and hope that through years of talking, they would resolve their differences. It had various phases. One idea of this phase was that Israel slowly in stages would begin to withdraw its troops or redeploy its troops from parts of the West Bank and Gaza that it had, uh, at the areas that occupied in, in 1967. And you can see in the West Bank, this deployment, a redeployment was very complicated. It made this, the West Bank like this kind of Swiss cheese thing as areas came under different levels of Israeli control, Palestinian control, shared control. That Palestinian control was essentially a very new entity that was created as a part of this process called the Palestinian Authority. What was the Palestinian Authority? It was created as a kind of self-governing apparatus for Palestinians to have a set of institutions to govern in those territories from which Israel had withdrawn as a part of the process. Again, the Palestinian Authority is not a state. It's a set of institutions, education, health, uh, lawmaking, and so forth, um, where, where Palestinians could have some degree of self-government still under essentially the rubric of, a, of an ongoing occupation. The hope was Israel would withdraw from territories, the PA would establish itself, the, the two parties would increasingly trust each other. And by 1999, after five years of negotiating, they would come to a final agreement on the end of the conflict and address all of the really tough outstanding issues like how to share Jerusalem, what about the right of return? What about water? What about settlements? What are the final borders? That didn't happen. There was no peace process. There was no peace agreement. This conflict is now arguably worse than ever. So why did this peace process fail? There are lots of reasons. Some would say it was doomed from the start because of this very open-ended logic. Um, but let me just highlight two, two factors among many. One is the fact that it was actually an extremely violent 
time. Um, uh, an American born Israeli settler named Baruch Goldstein in 1994, just months after the peace process begins, walks into a mosque, opens fire and, and kills a couple of dozen Palestinian worshipers. Uh, later, an Israeli uh, extremist assassinates uh, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who had signed the peace agreement. Uh, Palestinian opposition groups who are opposition to the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority begin carrying out suicide bombings inside Israel. These suicide bombings had never existed like this before. They begin during the peace process. The first uh, suicide bombing uh, is done by or the organization Hamas which it claims as a reaction to Baruch Goldstein's killing. Hamas is a, an Islamist organization that was founded in 1987 in the course of the first Intifada, um, calling not only for Palestinian liberation, but within this Islamist um, ethic and with uh, an ideology also of, of armed, armed struggle. So both Israelis and Palestinians look at this time as being quite violent and especially it, Israelis given these suicide bombings inside Israeli towns and villages. Um, there's also increasing settlement building. Um, so settlement, the settlement population actually doubles during the negotiation years. In addition, Israel institutes what it calls closure, which increasingly prevents Palestinians from moving from one place to another within uh, the Gaza Strip because um, Israel can uh, make checkpoints or require permits and prevent people from going from one place to another. So Palestinians look at this and say, we thought we were supposed to get an independent state, but all we're getting is, is um, actually losing more and more land and not even able to move around our own land. What kind of state and autonomy is this? We don't believe that Israel really uh, wants and will accept a truly independent Palestinian state where Palestinians live them, them on their own. So given all of these increasing frustrations, both ways in which both Israelis and Palestinians feel like the peace process has, has failed them. That's the context in which there is a second Palestinian uprising um, against the peace process, against occupation. It's the second Intifada and the second Intifada is much more violent and armed than the first Intifada had. It was really a militarized uprising, a kind of a mini war from 2000 to 2005 or six or so. Um, in the course of that second intifada, Israel has uh, an initiative that they call a disengagement from the Gaza Strip. Um, Israel takes its settlers and soldiers from Gaza, such there's no longer any Israeli presence in Gaza. Some say that um, the Israeli government views Gaza essentially as a demographic burden. It's, it's overcrowded with more than 2 million um, Palestinian civilians. And uh, it's no longer worth it to Israel to hang on to this because there's a very little number of, of settlers and uh, it's, um, it puts soldiers at risks and they just let, let Gaza go. So from an Israeli point of view, many say uh, Gaza is no longer occupied. There are no longer Israelis on the ground. But from an international law point of view, Israel or Gaza actually remains occupied. And that's because Israel, in coordination with Egypt, controls all the borders, controls what can go in and what can go out, who can go in and who can go out. It controls even how far out to sea Palestinian fishers are allowed to go. It controls the airspace um, and it can lock things or not lock things. So it, Gaza remains dense, impoverished. The United Nations famously in 2012 says, Gaza will be unlivable by 2020. Um, and its, its legal situation remains contested. And just a few other important po uh, political milestones I wanna mention that are really important for understanding the current moment. That is FETA, which was this political party formed in the 1950s and 60s, um, was the main party of the PLO the main party of the Palestinian Authority. In 2006, there are Palestinian Authority elections and Hamas, which was the main rival to Feta, wins those elections. This is a total surprise to most people. Hamas is able to form a government because they won elections free and fair, totally fair and square. Um, Israel, the United States, the European Union say Hamas is a terrorist organization. They've carried out all these suicide bombings and terrorism in Israel. We will refuse to work with any Palestinian Authority government ruled by Hamas until Hamas recognizes Israel and renounces violence. 
Hamas says, we won these elections fair and square. This is our right to rule over Palestinian civilians and outsiders can't demand and coerce us to, 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 make, to make these, these certain um, concessions. Um, that's a context in which there's some outside support for FETA to continue to contest Hamas from within, even after the elections, leading to a, a split and a kind of a violent conflict between Hamas and FETA, in which Hamas kicks out FETA from the Gaza Strip and consolidates and comes to rule over Gaza. FETA, accordingly, consolidates its control in the West Bank, and we have a split with the FETA-led Palestinian Authority that governs in the West Bank and the Hamas-led government that governs in Gaza. <clears throat> in that context, Israel tightens a blockade on Gaza because it wants to squeeze Hamas and it opposes Hamas, um, increasingly restricting what can come in and out, um, including basic life essentials for Palestinian civilians. Hamas responds to this blockade with rockets and missiles that it fires from Gaza into Israel. And you have a series of wars. This is the sort of a standoff in which Hamas wants Israel to, um, to lift the blockade. Israel wants Hamas to stop using violence and stop using rockets. And it explodes periodically into wars. A war in 2008, in 2012, in 2014, in 2021, and now, of course, it's the most horrific war um, we have seen, uh, but it's not the first um, uh, between Israel and the Hamas-controlled Gaza, um, of course, with, with civilians always paying the, the price. The last slide I wanna leave you with is the fact that increasingly people say this occupation thing that began in 1967 is now over half a century old. Occupation seems like a temporary term. Maybe we shouldn't use occupation anymore. Maybe we should recognize that Israel's control over the West Bank and Gaza is permanent. And if it is permanent or indefinite, how do we describe it? What are the words to describe it? Many human rights organizations, Palestinian, Israeli, and international have argued that the appropriate concept is apartheid. And the legal definition of apartheid is inhumane acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group over any other racial group and systematically oppressing them. So I will leave it to you to investigate. All of these human rights organization reports are available online. They're extremely informative. You can read them, you can debate them, you can contest them, you can agree with them. But what they're arguing is that they can trace a series of acts that are inhumane and that show that Israel wants is establishing its domination over these Palestinian territories. It doesn't have an intention of that being temporary. It wants to maintain that domination and all of this can be thought about as apartheid because there's one set of rules and rights for Israeli Jews and essentially lesser rights and lesser life are opportunities for Palestinian Arabs. All of this again on the eve of October 7th. So this was the reality existing before, before the current violence. Okay, I will stop sharing the screen and we can open it up for questions with the remaining time. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Perlman. I am going to just give a few seconds for quiet processing. And for Dr. Perlman to take a sip of water. No, no, I'm I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Okay. There are already some questions in the in okay. the chat. Do you guys want to read the questions or should I just go ahead and do them? Whatever you guys yeah. prefer. Yeah, I think okay. So first we are going to open up the chat. The stuff you see in there is um stuff that we have put in with the agreement and such. Okay. So does what does another co-host want to open up the chat? And then folks. You also can raise your little Zoom digital hand if you would like to ask a question. And in case you don't know this, there should be a little raise hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't see it, 
you'll um, you'll probably be able to access it in the more menu, which is three dots down below your Zoom. So now is the time for asking questions. Okay, thank you, Abu Bakr, go ahead. Abu Bakr, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. I can see your hand and also you're muted. Okay, we're gonna hold some space. Okay, now, now it's working out. Thank you, it was- Yeah, go ahead. All right, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. And I was just wondering, uh, if this was any other country uh, outside of Israel that is doing this occupation since 1967, how would the world uh, react, including the United States? That's a great question. I mean, it's it's hard. It's it's hard because it's based on a counterfactual. It's 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 hard to to, to be able to fully answer what um what would have been had history been different. Um, but I think that you're but you're getting to a, an important point that there seems to be a lot of um, double standards and and hypocrisies that um, human rights should provide a um, a neutral and universal standard for um, the rights that human beings are allowed, and um, international law should provide a common standard to say what are um, what are infractions that are not acceptable to the international community what are atrocities what are legal violations that if we lived in a in a in a um, a world of of recognized rights and recognized rules everybody would be held to the same standard and um, and if there would and there would be a standard to which states are held and we can see that's 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 not the case. Um, that there have been decades of violations of international law by the state of Israel. Um, there have been reams and reams of paper and studies um, uh, um, documenting them. Of course, Israel is not the only state in the international system that commits atrocities and that violates rights. I spent. You know, I've spent the last 12 years studying Syria and the crimes of the Assad regime against the Syrian people. There have been other genocides. There are other crimes. There is, um, you know, there's famine in Sudan as we speak. So, um, so, so Israel is not the only human rights violator, but it is one in which the United States um, continuously uh, um, vetoes United Nations resolutions that would condemn Israel which we don't see it doing to the same degree to any other state, as far as I know. And it is a state that to which the United States gives something like $3.8 billion in aid, including military aid, um, without which we, I cannot imagine that Israel would do what it does. So um, while Israel is not the only um, human rights violator, it is the human rights violator with, for whom the United States gives the overwhelming most support economic, military and political cover. So it is a human rights violator with which we, um, those of us who are US citizens or US taxpayers have a lot to reckon with because this is done with our name, it's done with our tax monies, it's done by our government. Um, so that's not a full answer to your question. It's not recreating the historical um, uh, counterfactual, but I'm inspired by your comment to, to, to answer in that way about the, um, the double standard that you rightly point out. So thank you, Abu Bakr. Amal, you are next. Go ahead. I have many questions, and thank you for the talk. I enjoy it. I have a class soon, so I will be very brief. Um, if we call United States Christian state, how many of us will get upset about that? Yeah. Calling a state Jewish as a religion, I should think that it should be questioned. And I would not like my country to call Islamic country because there is more people there with different diversity. So there's many people accept calling a Jewish state while we know in our core after what we reach, how much people fight in the United States to make it 
acceptable, more diverse for many people? So this is the first question. Do we accept any state called by their one religion mean? So um, it's a terrific question. Thank you. And I, and I think that you, um, you know, you did a good job of both ask, asking the question and answering it quite powerfully. So I um, will take that. But I would say in, in addition, I mean, I think, I think Judaism is a, is a bit complicated because it is a religion, but it is also um, for many Jews and something of an ethnic and national identity. So when Zionism is created as a movement, it's of Jews in Europe saying, we we constitute a nation. We're not just a religion. We are a nation that should have a nation state. So, um, so it is a religion, but I think it's not only a religion. I think it, there's an ethno-nationalist, a religious ethno-nationalist sort of sort of a combination, um, which is why I think this this idea of apartheid applies, or many argue that apartheid applies. That Jews are not just a religious group, but in in the context of Israel and Palestine, they're a racial group. It's an it's a ethnic nationalist racial group. So whether we see Judaism only as a religion or as a nation or as an ethno-national entity, what is clear is that in this territory, Jews have one degree of rights and non-Jews are systematically denied those rights because they are not Jews. So I think that maybe gets to so the heart of your, your question is if a state should exist for all of its citizens, if all individuals deserve to have a state where they have rights and they have legal protections and they have the opportunity to choose their own rulers, how can we accept a place in which, how can we accept political arrangements in which some people have rights based on their ethnicity, their nation, their race, their religion, and some people don't? That is the reality that we have in Israel and Palestine. And I think that is, is totally, totally unacceptable. Whether you, see, whether you see Judaism as a nation, national group or as a religion, the fact that Jews have some rights and Arabs do not because they are not Jews is something that every single person, I think I totally agree, have to ask themselves, is this something we would accept? And, and not just as a reality, <laughs> As inequalities and and disenfranchisement agree, it exists in the United in the United States, for example, with some some people having more rights effectively than others. But actually, as the as the letter of the law, both de facto and de jure being the reality, um, yeah, that's that's what we have. So thank you for for calling that out as such. Okay, thanks, Nathan. You're up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, the question I have regards the, um, the tw uh, 2006 elections. I heard President Clinton uh, say that, um, that uh, was it Fatah ran two groups in most of the elections uh, along with Hamas. And so that splits, like that split the vote and that he said that was the reason that, why he believes that Hamas uh, got into power. Could you talk about that? And could you I don't, could you explain more about why they ran to, like the same party ran two candidates? Yeah, no, I completely, completely agree. And that was in almost every, every, you know, village and district. Are you a political scientist? No, no I, I just watched <laughs> a whole bunch of that stuff. Okay, no, perfect. <laughs> I'm about to say, you're asking, you're asking a total political science wonky question, which I really appreciate. Um, Fatah is a, you know, a really kind of famously undisciplined undisciplined movement. And Hamas is, was extremely more organized and disciplined with a stronger leadership and stronger control over its own choices. So what you can imagine the kind of typical situation as you take a Palestinian town like Bethlehem, FETA members couldn't agree on who would be the rep who would be the candidate in, in Bethlehem. Person's like, I sh it should be me, it should be me, it should be me. They were disagreeing and they would both say, they would both put their names up as candidates because the, essentially the political party couldn't agree on one person and they didn't have a system of primaries. So people would disagree and they would both be there and in almost every municipality um, or, or governorate, FETA people split their votes. Some FETA went for candidate A and some people went for candidate B. And Hamas was essentially more logical, more strategic, ran a much smarter campaign, would put one candidate and all Hamas would go to that person. So if you compare the popular vote between Fatah and Hamas, Hamas's um, advantage was quite small. But if you compare the number of seats, it was much larger, almost like we kind of have with our electoral college because essentially it ran a smarter and more disciplined campaign. So I can, well, what we can see the 2006 election was a clear win for Hamas. It doesn't necessarily mean this resounding Palestinian um, 
uh, vote in favor of Hamas as an organization or its ideology. And even those who voted for Hamas, many did so not necessarily because they wanted Islamism or they wanted this armed, armed violence strategy. Fatah had been the dominant party for decades and it was totally corrupt and it was failed and it was authoritarian. And like anywhere, people vote against the incumbent when the incumbents fail. They're like, these people don't deserve to rule anymore. It's time to have an opposition. So you can also, I mean, I think now, especially after October 7th, people, there's also a discourse about Hamas as this almost like embodiment of evil and radicalism. Um, and the acts of October 7th, I think are appalling, but it's also a political organization that is embedded in Palestinian politics. And we can understand some of its motivations and what it does in its decision-making um, in, a, in much more mundane political factional competition. That's a part, that's a part of the story of Hamas too. That is so interesting. Thank you for asking that question, Nathan. Um, okay, so we have folks with their hands up and also a lot of questions coming in the chat. We are going to try to manage things in the order that we saw them. And so Rachel is next. And then we're going to go to the chat for a couple of things before you, Elizabetta. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, when at what point did America start having ties with Israel's government? And then, like, at what point, like, have they always kind of been helping have power, or had that started after Israel had already established the idea for the nation state? Excellent, excellent. So, so United States recognized Israel upon its declaration of independence in, on May 14th, 1948, very quickly. But in the first years of Israeli um, statehood, the US actually wasn't its main backer and it wasn't its main source of arms. Its main source of arms was actually France until the 1960s. Um, and then US support for Israel really starts to sort of take off in the late 1960s and in early 1970s. And one of the contexts of that was a sort of Cold War context in which um, some of the Arab states were, um, were linked to the, to the Soviet Union or seen as part of that block or the non-aligned block. And Israel was sort of like our main ally in the area. Um, so, and there's also of course other, lots of other reasons for Israel, US support for Israel. But um, well, while the US had recognized the state of Israel after 48, the Soviet Union did as well. And most states of the world did, except for, for the Arab states, which uh, did not and and maybe some other allies. Um, uh, the U.S.'s really strong relationship, and especially with aid and with military aid, is a product of the 1960s prim primarily. Thank you. The next question is from the chat. Um, what place or power does international law actually have in this situation? Do the U.S. and other colonial nations have the only real power and say and what happens? How can we fight against this to change it? Yeah, I mean, it's a terrific question. And I share the, um, the, the, the cynicism of that international law does not have much of an enforcement mechanism. You know, we live in a world of nation states in which states and governments do what they want. And they're only stopped when um, other governments and, so and states stop them. I think it is a world of power politics and states do what they can get away with unless other states stop them. So I, well, I think international law is important and I am saluting all of these efforts in the International Criminal Court and International Court of Justice to try to, you know, for example, have what is declared in Israel as, or Gaza as a genocide and to, to declare the occupation crimes against humanity. Um, Ultimately, and I'm a political scientist, I'm going to be biased and say it's politics that runs the day. And, you know, what we should do uh, as people in the United States is try to pressure as much as possible our government to have a different policy. If the United States were not enabling Israel's actions right now, I could not imagine that they would happen. The U.S. has tremendous amount of leverage that it could use to force Israel to stop killing civilians, to stop starving civilians, to, um, to work towards a real political solution. And thus far, we are using our, our leverage to essentially allow um, the killing that Israel is doing in the Gaza Strip. The United States could really change things. And we can ask ourselves as citizens or residents in this country, what can we do to change that?
Okay, Elisabetta, go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, well, thanks uh, for the very informative um, presentation. Uh, I have a question about the two-state solution. When international leaders say they support the two-state solution, do they mean, is it implied that they also support ending the apartheid system and the occupation? Because I don't hear them talking about that. And so, I, and I don't think that uh, the two-state solution will work while continuing the status quo. So is it implied that they mean that? Or uh, or they don't they are discuss about the occupation? No, thank you. So I guess the idea of a two-state solution is that the West Bank and Gaza Strip that Israel occupied in 1967, that would become an independent Palestinian state. And that Israel would exist in its the borders it had before the 1967 war, and there would be a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, you've seen these maps, and you can say, how is this two, this two territories that aren't even contiguous going to exist as a state? But after long history um, and compromises, the Palestinian national movement largely came to this idea that this was kind of the best that they would get. The huge amount of the, the huge majority of the population of those areas were Palestinian civilians. Israel didn't want to rule over Palestinian civilians anymore. That was sort of the thinking in the early 1990s and the idea that there would be an independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. So the, the hope was there would no longer be an apartheid system and that Israel would no longer rule over the West Bank and Gaza Strip. There would be a new Palestinian state that had its control of its own borders, its own flag, maybe its own currency, and it would be independent and there would be two states side by side. Um, but um, the increasing settlement, building of settlements in that same area that Palestinians thought would become a state seemed to preclude Palestinian sovereignty. Um, and at the same time, Israel said, why did Israel want a two-state solution? Because they thought it would lead to an end of, of, of violence against Israelis. And that, that didn't happen during the peace process years either. So at this point, when people talk about a two-state solution, I think it's something of almost the inertia of a discourse from the 1980s and 1990s, when that was the vision in the Oslo peace process. Could there be some independent, sovereign Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza that truly controls its own borders and its own affairs that Israel has no control over? Would Israel accept that? Well, there are many members of the current Israeli government that say no way, no way would we ever accept any kind of Palestinian sovereignty. And a two-state solution implies real Palestinian independence and sovereignty, not under Israeli control. And it doesn't seem like the current Israeli uh, political scene will tolerate that. So in the absence of that, I don't know what people are saying as a solution. The status quo is, a, is arguably, many say, the status quo is one of apartheid. Either we change that or that's the status quo. So unless you're coming up with a vision of change, implicitly you're saying this is acceptable the default is the reality. And that's why I think these human rights organizations have gone to such extents to be able to convince us, what is that, what is that status quo that you're called? What is the status quo we see? Apartheid is the only, only term to use it, to describe it. Okay, we're gonna squish in one more question, <laughs> which was um, Zara's question in the chat. Let me look at it. Zara asked me to read it. Um, and then I'm gonna say two quick things afterwards. And I'm so sorry that not everyone got to ask their questions. Well, me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, the question is, I'm curious what Dr. Perlman means by Islamist groups and Islamist ethics. Right, so Islamist, um, Islamist is, 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 Islamist and Islamism is a, is a term that is used to differentiate, it's a kind of political Islam. So Islam is a religion, Ism, you know, ism is a kind of a, a word you think of as an ideology. So communism, um, anarchism, ism being a political, um, a, 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 a political vision for how politics should be run, how a state should be organized, what is the source of law, how people should operate. So, so Islamism is a kind of political Islam. It's 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 a, a political ideology that uses Islam, that refers to Islam, that kind of a religious ideology. For example, as opposed to Fatah, the other main Palestinian rival, which is nationalist. Its only vision is we want a Palestinian state. It has no, it's secular, it has no religious uh, real 
real ideology. So when I said an is Islamist sort of ethics, I think I meant the Islamist ethos, I think is what I said, or what I meant to say, I apologize if I didn't, meaning that it had uh, an Islamist ideology, essentially, and an Islamist um, uh, identity. So it, it's calling for, for, Palestinian, for Palestinian independence and Palestinian nationalism, but with an Islamist vision of how that free Palestine should be organized. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, oh, Claudia, I see your chat. I'm so sorry that we have to close this. We're a minute over. Um, Dr. Perlman, thank you so much for your time, your expertise and joining us at the Seattle Colleges. I am humbled. Um, the next COSI talk, Thursdays at noon, everyone. The next one is about environmental injustice in Palestine. You will have to register on Zoom. Um, there are all kinds of guides and resources available through the libraries on all of our campuses. Come in and see us if you have questions, if you want more resources, if you want to explore these ideas. And we're going to be talking about it all quarter. So I'm glad you all are here. Thank you. Can I just say one, one thing to Claudia's question, which I just saw? I appreciate that, Claudia, but I think the term is, is Islamism, Islamia, is, I think it's, you know, it's, it's totally used in, in Arabic as, um, and at least it's very much used in the Arab world as, as a, it's a political, a political ideology, which I think is important to distinguish because some people can be Muslim and, be, and, and uphold Islam as a religion, but say Islam has no role in the political sphere. So they can be Muslim, but not Islamia. So I would just, I and mean, we can we can debate that, but I I think it is a term that I use that very much comes from the region itself, um, and I and I and other analysts learn it because it's used in the region itself, and this is what what Hamas actually is the term it would use to describe itself too. That was a great close. Thank you, thank you for for um, giving us that last pearl of wisdom. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it's my interpretation. It can be debated, but that's what I would say. Uh, yeah. Many thank yous in the chat. I, I'm the one with the red button. I'm going to click it now. Thank you all for coming. Take, Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks.